Well, good morning, church. Good to see you today. Good to see a lot of our campers back. People at camp, uh, church camp last week. We've had people going to camp different times and different places uh, throughout the summer, and some will be going in coming weeks. But we're glad you're having that good time. One of our daughters is on her way to camp this morning to be a counselor, camp that she grew up at as a camper. So that's always a great part of summer. Uh, but we're, we're glad you're here and we can worship together. You know, Jesus, in his great sermon, made famous, I guess, the, uh, the method of teaching called the Beatitude or the, the blessing statement. The place he did that or the place it's recorded is in Matthew 5, verses 3 through 11, where he said things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, and so forth. Now, Jesus may have made it famous and, and familiar to us, but he was not the first one to use this method. Um, it can be found in the Old Testament. You can read Beatitudes in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, for instance. And we have uh, found in this series that there are seven blessings like this spoken in the last book of the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation. We've been referring to them as the seven blessings of the apocalypse. And today we're going to open to the, the last chapter again of this great book, chapter 22, and look at the final one of these seven Beatitudes. So let's begin together by reading the text, Revelation chapter 22. We'll read verses 10 through 15. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. One of my favorite authors and American personalities is Mark Twain. And uh, it's said that he said the following about the Bible, quote, I don't worry about the parts of the Bible I can't understand. I have enough trouble with the parts I can understand. That might be a pretty good philosophy in general when approaching the Bible, if you think about it. There's some wisdom in that. The book of Revelation, for instance, has confused and intimidated people ever since it was written down. Uh, and, and people have struggled with it for 2,000 years, and they're still struggling with it. But a good approach to Revelation, I believe, is the Twain approach, we might call it. Let's focus on and apply and worry about, if we need to worry, the parts that we do understand. And, and not be overly distracted by parts we do not. For example, we can understand these seven blessings. They're pretty clear in, in their meanings and, and really the context around them, um, around these blessings, they're, they're not that difficult. For instance, uh, these verses that we read, 
this morning from chapter 22 are pretty clear, aren't they? What they say, pretty black and white. Now, I know that uh, the black and white parts of the Bible are often hard for people not to follow, but to swallow. Especially uh, these days when people seem to love the color gray. For example, many people in our gray world don't like the, the uh, rather matter-of-fact black and white statement that Jesus made one time when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that's pretty plain, not hard to understand. We might call it black and white, right? Jesus also said one time about eternal life in particular, he said, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there are who go that way. But small is the gate and narrow the way to eternal life and only a few find it. Plain, right? Clear. Pretty black and white. So here in our passage today from Revelation 22, the language is quite stark and very plain as it speaks of those who get into the city of God and those that do not. It talks about, on the one hand, evildoers and, and filthy people, and on the other, the righteous and the holy. Jesus says, I am coming soon. And he says, the time is near. And he says, when he comes back, he's bringing judgment, recompense, repayment. You see, when Jesus comes back, he is not offering a second chance. He offers one right now. He's been offering one for 2,000 years. When he comes back, he's not offering a second chance. Today is the day of salvation. And indeed, tomorrow may be too late because tomorrow he may come back. And when he comes, he comes as judge. The first time, he came as the humble servant and, and the Messiah offered to mankind. At his second coming, he will be, as the text says, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He will be the judge of all the earth when he returns. And when he returns, some he will save. We'll talk about them in a moment when we look at the blessing. Many he will judge and punish eternally. Notice verse 15, the word outside. That is outside the eternal city, outside of heaven away from the presence of God, eternally, forever. The verse again says, outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This has been very consistent in the book of Revelation as it draws to a close. As, as John's vision uh, portrays the, the glories and the wonders of heaven, it always pauses to remind us that many are excluded from that blessed place. Many are without, cast out, uninvited. They had rejected the gracious invitation of God their entire lives 
while here on earth, and now at the end, the invitation is finally closed. Now the sentence is executed. So we have, for instance, chapter 20, verse 15, where it says, And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want you to think about the question this morning, is your name found in the book of life? Is your name written there? Chapter 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then chapter 21, verse 27, speaking again there of the eternal city of God, it says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, I ask, is your name written there? Then, of course, in, in verse 15 of our passage this morning, chapter 22, those locked outside the gates of God's city are described in that verse. But this isn't just a revelation thing. Uh, lest someone think, you know, well, you said that revelation is often figurative, so maybe things really aren't this black and white in eternity. No, this is the witness of all the Bible. This is what we read from beginning to end in God's word. Let me give you just one more example, but outside of the book of Revelation. If you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul addresses verses 9 through 11 of that chapter, again using very stark words inspired by the Holy Spirit. He writes this, Do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Scripture is clear about eternity. It is plain. It is black and white. It is not hard to understand what it says about this. You know, there may be parts of Scripture that are hard to follow at times and that take extra study and thought, a lifetime of study. But as far as who is in and who is out of God's eternal place of glory, that is as clear as can be. We may not like it. We may not uh, care for the truth. We may, we may wish that the facts were other than they are, and we may hope against hope that God will change his mind and make an exception in the cases that concern us, but it is not hard to follow what is written. I know that it has been out of fashion and unpopular to talk about such things in church for a long time now. I know that because I've been in church for a long time now. You know, we want to hear about 
God's mercy and forgiveness and grace. I understand that. And, and I agree that that is what we ought to major in because that's what scripture majors in. Good news. But there's no good news without first recognizing the bad news. One of the great old hymns that we sing from time to time, written by John Newton. Uh, we know it as Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I want you to notice in that song, even in that great song about grace, we have both the bad news and the good news. There's one line in particular in that song that says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." See, God's grace is about both. Never forget that. I once was lost in sin. Bad news, you see. But Jesus took me in. Good news. In every gospel song, in every gospel scripture, we have both. But let's not forget the blessing. The blessing this morning, verse 14 of our text. Here we learn about those who get admitted to the city of God. Those who are ushered in to the presence of God. Those who go to heaven, however you want to term it, however you want to describe what we're talking about. Again, verse 14, Revelation 22. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, these were mentioned before, back in chapter 7 of the book, verse 14. You might remember that phrase, do you remember what it is, what it was that they washed their robes in? The blood of the lamb. It says there in chapter 7. And again, this is uh, not just a revelation thing. Uh, I hope you noticed when we quoted from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 a moment ago. Similar language there. When he made that lengthy list of of the lost, those who will not gain admittance to God's eternal city, he said to the Corinthians that he was writing to, he said, some of you were exactly like that, exactly like that list of sins. He said, such were some of you, but you were washed. Good news. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. For every bit of bad news, there's good news. This picture, yes, it's there. I found this picture, and one reason I chose to use it this morning, it's just a coincidence to me, but the fellow who's getting his washed robes in this picture, just as a spitting image of a guy that I was blessed to baptize in West Virginia. Um, he and I had completely different lives leading up to that moment. I was born and raised in the church, probably lived sort of a sheltered existence, Christian family and, and all the blessings and advantages I had. His life wasn't, it was like the absolute opposite and he had seen and done everything. And this picture reminds me 
of when his robes were washed and the tear in his eye. Looks just exactly like him. But it stands for anybody, you see, who washed their robes. In this last blessing of the apocalypse, number seven, who's blessed? Those who get to live in the eternal city with God and the Lamb. Why do they get to live there? Because they've been washed, prepared, cleaned up in the blood of Jesus. Blessed are those who wash their robes. In fact, it's interesting that the, the verb tense there helps us appreciate this even more. It's present tense, which to us grammar geeks, we understand it means continuous action. So we could translate this, blessed are those who continue to wash their robes in the blood of the lamb. You see, the, the washing, the cleansing is not a one-time event. It's continual. Because until we get to heaven, we continue to sin, right? We're not perfect just because we've been baptized. We continue to mess up. Sin ends when heaven begins. That's one reason it's so wonderful. But until then, we continue to struggle. So we continually need to be washed. And the blood of the Lord is more than powerful enough to do so. What's the difference between those in the city and those outside of the city? What's the difference between those who go to heaven and those who don't? What's the difference between the saved and the lost? It's not that the saved are better than the lost individually. Christian, don't look down your nose at somebody else that's struggling in sin, hasn't been washed yet. It's not that you're better. No, the saved are washed. They're cleaned. They've been prepared for eternity by the Lord. The lost are not. They're not prepared. That's it. That's the difference. I'm reminding, reminded of something else that this same John, who, who wrote down his vision in Revelation, Something else that he wrote in another letter, 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. He wrote, but if we walk in the light, as he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son continually cleanses us from all sin. That's where we want to be. My friends, that's the situation we want to be in. Walking with God in the light, continually being washed up, cleansed, prepared for eternity. And we can be that because the Lamb of God shed his blood for every one of us at the cross. We can be walking in the light. We can be prepared for his return. It's there for us if we'll just accept it, if we'll just obey it. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Are you blessed this morning? Are you ready for his return? Are you ready for the eternal city? That's the only place you want to be. 
And if you need to take and receive that blessing this morning, as we always do, we offer an opportunity right now, although that invitation is always open until the Lord returns. We offer it at this moment. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. If you need to make a change, if you need to obey the gospel or, or to return to the Lord, we offer you his blessing as together we stand and sing.